Oh, look at these pants. The Wrestling Life. Hey everybody, it's The Wrestling Life, it's episode 305, it is the third week of June of 2022, I'm Ethan, and I'm Liam. Liam, we say this every week, but we have so much to talk about. I, <laughs> and I feel like I've said this five or six times this year, but I genuinely can't remember a week where we've had this much just ridiculous big breaking news happening within like a few hours of each other. Yep. Uh, Wednesday was a big day this week in terms of, in terms of news. So broke on Wednesday, obviously the biggest story in years uh, broke on Wednesday that WWE's board of directors was invested. Um, the chairman of the board and the CEO of Vince McMahon after um, someone had anonymously emailed the board <laughs> to inform them that Vince McMahon had paid a former WWE employee uh, $1 million up front A total of three million uh, to be paid over the next five years. A total of three million dollars in uh, in hush money, essentially. After he had a personal relationship with her, and uh, and and Johnny Ace is also involved. <laughs> of course, boy is um, he. So. And then uh, the uh, the board had then been alerted that there are probably more NDAs in the past related to um, Mr. Laurinaitis. Um, yeah, so there's obviously um, the 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 details of the uh, alleged sexual misconduct by Mr. McMahon. Um, suggests that uh, he began a relationship with a paralegal. <laughs> then he then once he began the personal relationship, he doubled her salary. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then when he was quote unquote done with her, he, as it very memorably stated in the uh, the email, passed her off to Mr. Laurinaitis like a toy, unquote. Where Mr. Laurinaitis and then he then uh, uh, she was moved from the WWE's legal department to being Mr. Laurinaitis' assistant and then uh, and then yeah. So I I don't know how to talk about this if that's not (laughs) if that's not abundantly clear. (laughs) I mean it's 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 fascinating for many reasons. One, because you imagine this sort of thing happens in corporate America quite frequently um, and very rarely comes to light. And it it would be fascinating because the thing is that like mainstream, like this was broken by the Wall Street Journal, right? It wasn't broken by Fightful. (laughs) Right. Uh, Right. And... So, and like CNBC, I saw it, picked it up. Like, this is a story on like the corporate, you know, traded on the stock market side of WWE way more than it is on the the pro wrestling side of things that we would normally talk about on a show. Um, Because, yeah, if you are a fan of pro wrestling and know even kind of have even like a cursory knowledge of who Vince McMahon is, as a person, this doesn't, uh, well, first it wouldn't, I don't think it would surprise very many people. Um, and it also would be very far down the list of the alleged horrible things that this person has done. 
So I think there's like, it wasn't like, there wasn't that shell shock for people who are in this bubble. But uh, I think for people not in that bubble who just saw very wealthy CEO of, of major company, you know, paid $3 million in a hush pact to, uh, to his, his, uh, his former paralegal who, you know, he had also, you know, exchanged additional salary for, you know, in exchange for, you know, a sexual relationship. It's like, yeah, I mean, you kind I feel like it's like, it's, it's, we're so used to the sleaze of, as you know, as much as we like to think, I think strides have been made, the sleaze of the wrestling business, especially of those in power in wrestling, that this is like, this would barely be a blip for, I think a lot of people, if it were not being given, you know, real mainstream news attention. And it's just the, the I, I can't wrap my head around this being the thing that could like genuinely hurt Vince McMahon or, or get him ousted from, from the company or anything like that. It just doesn't seem possible again, based on the laundry list of other, Arguably, I don't want to discount the experience the the woman involved had or say that she didn't go through probably quite a bit of trauma, but on the list of Vince McMahon's alleged crimes, this is not, you know, this is not making the top 10 maybe. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a very, it's very strange. I think the other side of this that is interesting is like the palace intrigue side of it, of well, if this if Vince did have to step down, who would take over? Well, we know we have an idea of that. Um, his son, Nick Khan. But like who would take over the the day to day running the wrestling show side of things like there's who leaked the story in the first place when Vince McMahon's daughter left the company publicly in uh, in the beginnings of May. This this investigation, according to The Wall Street Journal, started in April who knew what, when is this, is this, did somebody, you know, a former business or current business rival of Vince's leak this? Like there's, there's a lot of palace intrigue and, 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 and the want for like hot gossip on that side of it. But yeah, it's as far as like a wrestling podcast talking about it, I don't, I feel woefully out of my depth trying to discuss what this could mean for WWE as a, like as a corporation and that seems to be the only side affected by this immediately. I know there was some speculation from people in the company that I think Sean Ross Sapp reported that they think that Johnny Ace could be could be the one that faces the consequences for all of this. Um, but other than that, like I don't I don't know. I don't know if if this will at all affect the wrestling television side of WWE's business. It's an interesting test case because if this were anyone else in any other business, I think the gut reaction and then reflex is, well, they're done. Mm -hmm. And I don't get that sense with, with this. I don't think Vince is done. I think Johnny Ace will be the, the sacrifice. And I think yeah, he'll be let go or resign probably on Friday afternoon this week. Um, but I, I don't think this is the thing that kills Vince McMahon. Does Johnny Ace have to call himself to fire him? <sighs> Sorry, can't you see work out? He has two phones, like when Batman is talking to Bruce Wayne in the Adam West Batman show. Yeah, hey, kid. Yeah. <laughs> That's the bad news. What is it? I thought I feel like I've been doing good work here. <laughs> yeah, there is there is that. So I mean, it, it's not breaking news that Johnny Ace is a creep. No, there's a lot of stories out there. Like, you know, there's I 20 think, years worth of stories. Yeah, there's I mean, that was that was a, you know, a frequent name. And we, we've we've kind of poked fun at it a lot. But over the years, whether it was Johnny Ace or Jr. or anybody who's been in that talent relations role, uh, there's a lot of stories about them either a abusing your, their power or b being the guy who does the dirty work for, for upper management. And that's, you know, that's, that's who Johnny Ace is. And 
who he's always been. So yeah, there's a lot of a lot of stories about that guy being a bad guy. I mean, it's you know, not that this could possibly matter. Again, in the world of professional wrestling, both of these men are married, <laughs> and 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 what? things like that. So there's there's that side of it too. That I guess you could say there's public public scandal uh, on that end. But again, yeah, I don't, I don't. It would be amazing to me. It would be absolutely amazing to me if this if there was any sort of real world consequences for Vince in this. But yeah, Johnny, Johnny will take it. He's probably going to be gone for let's say at least eighteen months before he's back in that talent relations role again. That's that's right. Can you imagine the Johnny Ace rehab public image rehab tour? Oh man, maybe he can go on the Bella's podcast and apologize for stepping out on their mother. Uh, he, maybe he maybe he'll get a podcast with. Oh, maybe he'll do a Conrad podcast. There oh. you go. People love oh. those for some reason. Well, yeah. So remains to be seen what, if anything, comes of the Vince McMahon story. But definitely a very big story. Um, Vince had a very bad day on Wednesday. Um, his uh, <laughs> his representative, he's being sued for by Oliver Luck, the former commissioner of the XFL, for uh, $23.8 million. And Vince is countersuing Oliver Luck. And uh, the two sides are supposed to go to trial in July. And the two sides met on Wednesday. Their attorneys met on Wednesday to uh, try to mediate some kind of settlement. And uh, the talks lasted nine minutes. <laughs> no settlement. They're going to trial. So Vince, who personally guaranteed Oliver Luck's $24 million salary, of which he still owes him $23.8 million, <laughs> this says he <laughs> fired Luck for cause. Luck says I didn't. I was not fired for cause. Um, anyway, so the XFL, which Dwayne Johnson and company then bought for fifteen million dollars, Vince is being sued for twenty three point eight million dollars, <laughs> and uh, that yeah. So that's still going to trial next month. So bad day for Vince on Wednesday. No doubt. I mean. I mean, going back this story and the and the Vince McMahon Nick Khan Palace intrigue angle on the other story, boy, what a what an ultimate victory for the Dwayne Johnson brand if he if his if his best pal Nick ends up running WWE, who are I mean he kind of already is, but if 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 it's by some miracle Vince were to be ousted and and Nick Khan reigns supreme and takes the throne. Hunter's working in the basement and Dwayne owns the XFL. Just what a, what a coup. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure we all made up and we hug and smile when we see each other, but you know, Dwayne seems like a guy who would remember that they uh, quote unquote forgot to renew his contract in 2004 and, uh, and, uh, and all of the various times Hunter tried to sabotage his career and like, you know, maybe we forgive, but we don't forget what a, what a nice like feather on the cap for uh, for for Dwayne for Dwayne. Finally, a win for Dwayne. Everything's coming up, Dwayne. <laughs> so, uh, my favorite wrestler might have uh, negotiated her release from WWE this week. Sasha Banks, according to Raj of Wrestling Inc., he heard that on Wednesday night, also on Wednesday night, that. <laughs> She had uh, been released by WWE. Her lawyers were involved. No one has been able to confirm this. As we're recording nearly 24 hours later. Um, not surprising given that she and Naomi were indefinitely suspended. And generally, as we've talked about many times on this program, I think Sasha Banks to AEW at some point is kind of inevitable. Uh, turns out maybe sooner than later. But um, Tasha Banks, uh, we're still waiting for confirmation, but possibly released by WWE this week. So I mean, that's man, that's that, it's fascinating because there is the thing where 
Sasha and Bailey and, you know, Becky and Charlotte, maybe to a lesser extent, like there are people in wrestling, especially specifically young women, people that work for WWE now who got into wrestling because of them. Like they have like significant impact. They have had a significant impact. We've talked, you know, we've talked before, like you can look at minute by minute ratings when on the occasions they're released, Brandon Thurston usually has a breakdown, you know, you know, quarter hours don't always tell the, the, the full story because if there's ads in them or whatever that, you know, that can, that can affect it. But you can look over the last two years of SmackDown and her quarter hours have pretty substantially moved numbers in ways that very few other people have. Um, you know, she made evented sort of made events at a WrestleMania, like uh, a night of WrestleMania. So it's like, well, if she never wrestled again, she'd probably be like a hall of famer. Um, and she's like 29 and also seems to really, truly, you know, love, love wrestling as an art form. And yeah, I would, I would assume sooner or later you would see her wrestling somewhere else if she is not. And if you're looking at places that could afford her and that could, put her on a stage um you know i just i don't think she's ended up an impact you know i don't i i, I yeah. think i think there's really only one other place she could go in this country at least where she could uh you know have that sort of star treatment so yeah it, it will be interesting to say if see if we get some someone else to confirm that story or obviously wwe doesn't announce releases anymore so we're probably not going to hear anything from the company but uh would be interest it'll be interesting to uh to keep an eye on that in the next uh the next week or so and and also what kind of non-compete there would have been negotiated if it's just the standard 90 days or if there's uh or you know depending on when her deal was up or how that how that works you remember andrade for some reason got no Mm non-compete that was that was weird and uh yeah but definitely sasha banks is the one half of the first uh women's um or no it was the second women's wrestlemania main event but um one half of the the first black women to main event wrestlemania Mm -hmm. uh first women's royal rumble match entrant um has every accolade that WWE uh, can offer. And if she is, in fact, gone, it's very... You can't tell the story of the four horsewomen anymore. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. can't, you can't boast about all these firsts anymore because that person won't be with your company anymore. It's... It's it's very odd that one of their one of their four their four horsewomen uh, will no longer be there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you see how they write around history with things like you know the TLC matches, depending on which you know <laughs> when the Dudleys or the Hardys or whoever work for them and when they don't. <laughs> Like yeah. it's they're they're very selective. They might acknowledge, you know, the other people involved in those matches' accomplishments, but they will, you know, sometime somehow uh, leave 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 her name out of it. And yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see WWE's version of the 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 women's revolution without one of the you know one of the biggest stars, and it may be the second biggest as far as like crossover appeal, like maybe the second biggest star of the, of the movement besides Becky Lynch and Stephanie, yeah. of course. Yeah. Well, she, Stephanie invented women's wrestling in 2015. That's right. And yet we also, yet we also have to embrace the trailblazers like Candace Michelle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Legends. When, when, Michelle McCool, whenever they come back. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, it, yeah, it very uh very we 
we've talked about for years. There's just too many connections between Sasha and AEW for her not to end up there someday. And if you want some semblance of freedom as a pro wrestler in the United States, it's not a great option, but it's the best option. Um, and she could still pursue outside projects if she wants to continue to try her hand at acting she could do that if she wants to go work stardom i'm sure they'd let her do that so yeah i as a fan um you know i don't think aew handles women's wrestling very well what (laughs) and (laughs) and so that uh that hurts that hurts me do you feel like she would be such a big star and you would be paying. I, like, I don't know how Tony feels about, you know, there's the, the always the Vince adage of if he's paying you money, he's going to book enough money. He's going to book you like a star no matter what, because that's his, his way of thinking. Like right. if, if, if they bring in Mercedes Renato at a, a big money deal, maybe she forces the issue of, of them having to book more than one women's feud at a time. Um, and, and just based on her star power and what they're paying her to see a return on that investment. But that's, that's a big, what if for sure. It was encouraging to me this week that Tony storm got a promo on dynamite because usually they only let Britt Baker talk <laughs> or if, <laughs> If, if another wrestler talks, it's during a Britt Baker promo segment. Sure. But Britt Baker and Tony Storm also were still went on at 925 and their match still went through a commercial break and they were still done by 935 on Dynamite this week. So I just they have so many people that I don't I don't think that uh, Tony Khan's philosophy is well, if I'm paying you I'm going to use you. I think it's uh, if I'm paying you, uh, you, you're you're another action figure on my action figure shelf, you know? (laughs) Sure. So definitely see how that goes. We'll get to AEW here in a second. Uh, Fivefold was reporting on Thursday this week that Randy Orton might be out for the year with a back injury. I thought that injury was a work. Apparently it's not Mm -hmm. Randy Orton out for potentially out for the rest of the year. Whew. What a, I mean, we, we did the, the big injury report last week, but yeah, it's just add them to the list, I guess. Um, I mean, not to rub salt in the wound, but man, it sure would be good if they pushed more than three people, huh? (laughs) Yes. Maybe, maybe this wouldn't be like a complete crisis if, uh, if there was only, you know, if they didn't only push Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, and Randy Orton on television, um, and then started to push Cody, but then he got hurt, uh, you know, maybe maybe it would be good to have more people you could plug in, uh, you know, at that uh, that main event level. But hey, you know, you live and learn. So the plan for this summer was Riddle challenging Reigns getting squashed. Um, <laughs> Orton challenging Reigns getting squashed and then Drew challenging Roman at the big stadium show uh, in the beginning of September and um, I don't know what they're going to do for uh, for SummerSlam now uh, here at the end of July Roman Reigns is working a very limited schedule yet he's defending his titles against riddle on television this week i don't understand this company anymore (laughs) yeah i mean i think we touched on a little bit last week my only read on it is it's a fox thing like they're they they wanted a big marquee match on their show and since since peacock and usa nbc universal gets all the other wwe stuff they just like put their foot down and demanded that roman do a match on their television but yeah, other than that, I don't it doesn't make a lot of sense to me either. But you know, that's <laughs> that's what we're doing. And and then there's that thing of okay, well, if he beats Riddle, they've added a stipulation that if Riddle loses, which he will, 
I think it's pretty safe to say that he can't challenge for the belt ever again. It's like, well, I mean, maybe do you think, do you feel like maybe they had an inkling of this going back a couple of weeks and that's why they had Lashley tease a, uh, a title match. Maybe he's the SummerSlam guy. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That certainly makes sense. I mean, he's got to actually he's got to get done with this wonderful uh, pose posing based feud with with theory first. But he he got baby oil thrown in his eyes on Monday, so he may be on the, on the shelf for a while. Um, for some reason, the main event angle overall was Austin Theory throwing baby oil on Bobby Lashley. Sure. Um, why not? Yeah. So I guess he's. If he's feuding with the United States champion, are we just gonna are we gonna unify the United States title with the uh, with the world titles so that we just never have any championships on the line on on television anymore? As I, I don't know. Sure, why not? Yeah, the championship so doesn't make the the show. The show makes the <laughs> championship or whatever their their adage is that they claim, even though they book certain champions much better than other ones. Sure. So WWE has the uh, the big title match on SmackDown this week, and then um, they've started doing Money in the Bank qualifying matches. It's like one of those autopilot TV cycles where you just book a bunch of matches, and then you can book a bunch of second chance matches and and things like that. So uh, there is that uh, AEW Dynamite this week did very bad numbers like 740,000 people watched this show mm-hmm. um, live or before 3 a.m. on on Thursday on on their DVRs um, not a big marquee show they're building towards the forbidden door which is a show with a bunch of matches on it coming up next Sunday they had originally advertised. I guess the Young Bucks won the tag team titles is probably the, the biggest news coming out of Dynamite this week. They had mm-hmm. advertised the Bucks defending or the Bucks going for the tag titles in a ladder match against the champions Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus and the Hardy brothers. Uh, and then Jeff Hardy got arrested for a DUI, and uh, the Hardys got taken out of the match. Jeff Hardy got arrested for allegedly driving under the influence this is um this is groundhog day i don't know what to say about jeff hardy anymore i mean yeah it's hard to you know you want to be sympathetic to people who have addiction issues and things like that you know most very few people i think in the world are not some in some way touched by that sort of stuff but i think that sympathy goes out the window a little bit when you're deciding to get behind the wheel of a car um and it's a it was a pretty intense scene by all reports i didn't watch the police dashboard footage but i'm aware that they drew their guns on him and he you know he could barely stand up and and uh you know it's it was also this happened at like 9 45 in the morning um just yeah it's it's awful it's not the first time I think there's a cynical promoter side of looking at guys like Jeff Hardy because for better or most of the time for worse, guys like that will always find a job because people like them. People buy their t-shirts. People will watch shows that they're on. uh, People will buy tickets to see them. Um, But so there's that cynical promoter side of it where you go, well, somebody's going to make money off this guy. Might as well be me. Let's see how much I can get out of him before he, you know, before he crashes and burns. Um, And yeah, it was, I think it was questionable to book him in this ladder match this soon after he, this soon after he had a concussion in a a match, a regular match with the young bucks a few weeks ago. Um, The understanding was that Jeff was pretty banged up because he was supposed to work a 10 man tag the following week. And they took him out of that match and, then all of a sudden, last week they announced you're, he's doing a ladder match this week, and he just he's been banged up. And we I think we talked about this one of the last couple shows, but 
you know, he and Matt have been working indie shows too. And I think some of those shows are just meet and greets, but they have definitely been wrestling on some of them as well. So it's just like this guy, this guy was just running ragged. And I just, I don't think being on the road is a good environment for Jeff's sobriety. And, but someone will always pay Jeff Hardy money to be on their wrestling show. So I don't, feel like there's a way that this ends in you know in a happy way like you hope you know he goes back to rehab and hopefully it sticks this time but you know if AEW ends up not bringing him back somebody else will hire him and we'll just start the cycle all over again unfortunately yeah so what if anything do you make of um, like two to three hundred thousand people not watching dynamite as as uh this week yeah i don't know it's it's hard to uh to really gauge because it it seemed to do way worse than other AEW shows even that had gone up against the the nhl and nba playoffs and stuff they so i don't it didn't feel like there was i i mean i know those like was there a finals game last night i think there was a stanley cup game okay but that's not doing that's not doing the gangbuster numbers like the NBA number yeah. games do so right I it, yeah I don't it didn't feel to me like there was an obvious thing because usually you know sometimes it'll be like you know if there's if it's an election season and there's a debate that might hurt wrestling on a given night or something like that with, at least with the older audience but I guess I, I'd have to see like the breakdown of who didn't watch of like what age yeah. group was most affected and try to parse it out from there but yeah it didn't feel like they had any heavy competition and yet this is like this is like you know pan, you know early pandemic numbers they that they were doing like when they were wrestling in QT Marshall's gym or whatever they were doing like 700,000 people yeah so we know that uh, Tony Storm's wrestling Thunder Rosa for the AEW Women's World Title on that show. We know Tanahashi is wrestling John Moxley for the vacant interim AEW World Title on that show. We know Orange Cassidy is wrestling Will Ospreay for the IWGP United States Title on that show in a match designed just to make Jim Cornette's brain explode. <laughs> and we have a weird six man tag with Chris Jericho. The uh, Sammy Guevara, who's now joined the Jericho faction, and Minoru Suzuki uh, wrestling Eddie Kingston, Wheeler Utah, and Shoto Umino. So it's, it's a bunch of matches, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't, man, this, like, I we talked about this. We weren't necessarily expecting, like, all these big dream matches, but this this card is, like, I mean, Moxley and Tanahashi is a big match and it, you know, that'll be a good, like, I think there'll be good wrestling on the show. I guess, depending on what Brian Danielson's status is, he might wrestle Zack Sabre Jr. on the show. That would be, I mean, they've wrestled before, but that would be like the closest thing to like an actual dream match, I feel, on the show. And I don't know if that's a dream match to like mainline AEW fans, like... Um, so yeah, as far as that, I, it's going to be a lot of stuff. They have said that Kazushika Okada is not going to be on the show. <laughs> so yep. I don't think he's going to be on the show. It looks like, well, the coming out of the show, people are like, well, they're going to do a three way with Cole, Jay White and, and a hangman. It's like, okay, but you just said you weren't doing that on on the show on Wednesday. So I'm not a big fan. I, I mean, Jay White's a heel or whatever. So somebody can come out and make the match and make him defend it against those two guys or whatever, I guess. But it's just like, I don't, I'm not a big fan of we're not doing this thing. And then the next week, yo, just kidding. Yes, we are. Um, uh, and I also don't know why you would have hangman publicly challenge Okada. If you weren't going to deliver that match, that's a, a lot of, a lot of head scratching stuff on on this on this build for this dream show that's going to be like one of their biggest audiences you know in person audiences ever in the the giant arena in in Chicago so like i think it'll be a good show and it'll have a cool environment because of how many people are there but 
I don't think we're getting like an all time great show. If that's what people were hoping for coming in. Yeah, it is very strange that all they, they talked about Okada for a month and then maybe Okada just decided this week or whatever that he's not coming to America for the show because it's his wife's birthday and his wife is uh, expecting a child. The boy King has spoken. Yes, he is the boy King. Uh, he lost the uh, IWGP world title to Jay White at Dominion uh, this past week. I was not expecting him to to lose that title all year. Mm-hmm. So in that sense, that was surprising. But now uh, Okada has uh, has somebody he can chase. Yeah, I guess you you can have him. Does Okada win the G one now? You think, or do you think he wins it back in like September? I don't. I I don't know. I I don't think they. There's a, definitely a lot more a lot more matches they can do right now with Jay White as champion than Okada as champion, just because they've had Okada run through everybody. But mm-hmm. um, I just f- felt like with it being the 50 year thing that Okada is going to hold the title all year. So he could, he could very well get it back at, in October or what have you. That that would not surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me if Okada wins G1 either. Because uh, Kota Ibushi's not in it this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they so they announced the, the G1 field, and it's a bunch of people you would expect. And then, like, I guess there is what? There's Tom Lawler and Lance Archer. Are they they're the big foreigner names that are that are coming in this year? Yeah, and uh, Aaron Hanari, Aaron Hanari is doing his first G one, and El Fantasma, who's a light heavyweight or junior heavyweight rather, is doing the G one for some reason. Okay, you guys, biggest field ever, four blocks this time because what we needed from New <laughs> Japan was more content, more matches. Yes, yes, there's that. Well, uh, we've covered a lot in uh, a fair amount of time here. Is there anything else uh, going on that you'd like to discuss? Uh, not not really. I mean, I guess if anything, because there's all this behind the scenes news breaking, it's nice that like Raw and Dynamite both kind of are bad and not and but not bad in interesting ways <laughs> this week. They're just kind of you know, Dynamite has the same problems it's had for, for months and what it often has when it's in a pay-per-view hype cycle, which is trying to do 45 different things in one segment and set up three different matches and also forward stuff for the next week of television. And and then Raw is just, you know, it's a, it's a barren wasteland of a show with, you know, even less star power than it did a week ago now that Cody's on the shelf, so... Yeah, I mean, it's it's nice it's nice that the television shows took a week off so that we could just focus on all the uh, the backstage and corporate side of wrestling. All right, everybody. Well, till next time, I'm Ethan and I'm Liam, and we'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Adios. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. Everybody, everybody, can read my Joker face. I heard someone describe... The, the idea of doing Joker 2 as a musical with Lady Gaga as the most chaotic sequel in movie history <laughs> because everyone who wanted a Joker 2 will be furious at this <laughs> and everybody that didn't care about it will now defend this to the death because it's so g-darn funny and isn't that just wonderful <laughs> it is definitely uh, an accurate statement I mean, what is more, what is more jokerized than, than turning your your moody Scorsese homage films into a uh, into a, a musicale?
starring Tony Bennett's good friend, Lady Gaga. Tony's still alive, right? I think so. Didn't they, tr- didn't they wheel his, his barely alive corpse out for one last holiday special last year? Yes, I think we talked about this at a family function. Yes. <laughs> well, he definitely doesn't know what's going on, but he can... <laughs> they have a cattle prod and they go, sing! <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it's a Christmas song, Tony. And they shock him until he remembers the words. Yeah. Yeah, real Johnny Cash situation towards the end there. Mm-hmm. Oh, not much happened in wrestling. <laughs> no more news. We're done. We've had enough news this week and probably for the year. And for my Joker face. Is that yours? Because that's a it's a wonderful turn of phrase. Perhaps. Uh, mainly because just because um do you have you noticed uh, up around your home the uh, campaign signs for um Billy Boniface? <laughs> uh I think I have seen. I thought it was Billy Bonafice, if I'm honest, but well. That that is just the whole joke. That's the whole joke. But ah. anyway, um, so I've been singing. Uh, can't read my can't read my can't read my Billy Boniface. <laughs> and then in the in the uh, the little the backup singers then sing. He says it's Bonafaci. <laughs> so. <laughs> There's like a guy running for county executive in Hartford County in Maryland. His name is Billy Bodaface. <laughs> I bet the kids were cruel growing up with a name like that. You would think so. Yes. Yes. But he says it's Bonafaci. <laughs> <sighs> like they could not be. Bi- He's got. Campaign signs the color of Brock Anderson's underpants <laughs> with bo- boner face <laughs> printed in large Times New Roman font across it. It's, uh, I think he knows what he's doing. Hmm. Ah. Well, we certainly remember it, don't we? Certainly do. It's, there's a now a Billy Boniface sign in my living room. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, I've taken one of those little signboards and put Billy Boniface on. I see. He says it's Boniface. <laughs> it's Boniface. <laughs> sure it is, sir. <laughs> I'm sure it is. You know, at a certain point, it's kind of a death of the author thing. Like, doesn't matter what you wanted it to be pronounced as. That's not how most people are going to pronounce it when they see that on a sign. Precisely. I try to keep on keeping on.